Okay. Good morning, everyone. We'll have the final uh, plenary session of this morning that will conclude the, the plenary sessions. We have had the contributions from, uh, from European City Challenges this morning. We have got as well the role of uh, small regions. And as well, the last uh, inspiring talk about innovative innovation through uh, network on thinking. And now we'll have a look uh, on a wider perspective with a, a very interesting and diverse panel. And we look at different uh, use cases and different uh, cities applying uh, sustainability in different regions of the world. The title of the session is uh, The City We Won, which is uh, a very interesting uh, and inspiring title. And we'll try to debate about uh, sustainability, resource uh, efficient, and resilient cities. If we think about this definition of a, uh, of a, of a city, uh, I've been collecting a bit of uh, information, and, and well, we always mean uh, designing cities with consideration to social, economic, environmental impact, and resilience habitat for existing population without compromising the ability of the next generations to uh, experience the same. And that's, that's very important because we tackle several things. We tackle design. Do we think about designing new cities, redesigning existing cities, how the cities are growing, expanding? We tackle as well social, economical, environmental, and resilient uh, aspects. Are those enough? Do we need to cover other things? How we can combine all of them with policies at the, at the same time? And as well, uh, well, we need to take into account that all of these concepts means, uh, most of the time, minimization of, uh, of inputs for the city requirements in terms of energy, water, uh, food, waste, air pollution, greenhouse uh, gases, or water pollution, among others. And this is extremely important. And finally, we have to take into consideration each city. We have different topologies of cities, different locations of cities. We have different uh, uh, um, geographical and uh, cultural uh, features for each of the cities. And this has to be taken into account. So it is an extreme challenge to apply all this uh, vision of which is the, our wish for our cities and, 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 and comply with all, those, uh, all these aspects. And for that, we have an extremely interesting panel with very different point of views. Uh, we'll have a, the point of view from the large metropole from South America. We'll have as well the point of view from a Caribbean island who suffered uh, recently major catastrophes. We'll have, a, uh, we'll have as well the view of a policymaker at the European level. And finally, we have the point of view from uh, IoT platforms and two approaches, open source platform and commercial platforms. With all of that, we'll try to give you some insights on uh, what we consider our uh, resilient and sustainable cities is, and we will go through the debate with uh, our panelists that uh, are here and will share their vision with, uh, with us. We, we will start with, uh, with Luis uh, Gerardo Rivera Marin from Puerto Rico. And Luis, if I, I, may I ask you, which is the best way for you to optimize resilient cities against major catastrophe versus a, a sustainable, daily efficient city? Uh, th thank you. And uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, FIRA and uh, Smart City for, for this invitation and al allowing uh, us to chair a panel with uh, such a great uh, group of uh, panelists. And I must say that balancing sustainability and balancing uh, resiliency, it's, it comes to play very importantly in, in a place like uh, Puerto Rico, we, where we are, right in the middle of Hurricane Alley in the, in the Caribbean. And uh, we must dream of what's our dream island, a smart island where all our visitors, we are big on tourism, all our visitors and residents are satisfied with the level of well-being. And for that, we need to provide as a government and all the stakeholders, we need to make sure that we provide efficiently the services on a sustainable manner. I remember last year we were devastated by two Cat 5, two hurricanes that were disastrous and just 
uh, destroyed our island. And I still remember watching from my window uh, through the storms as in my garden we had a big oak tree and we had some bamboo trees. And I saw that oak tree, a symbol of strength, how it toppled because of the winds. But then I could see uh, the bamboo trees in our yard, how they bent, flexibilized, and adapted to the winds. And I think that should be uh, the same uh, lesson for us. We need to adapt. We need to be flexible in our planning. So after the destruction, we have a blank canvas. And in Puerto Rico, we are planning to make sure that we build for sustainable economic development. So because of our island condition, we are respectful of our, the environment. And sustainability plays certainly a role in maximizing those resources. Certainly, innovation it's plays a huge role in the planning process. So in every, in every way that we can make things differently, whereby we started a process of evaluating and lesson learned um, the state of our infrastructure. We started working in collaboration with the communities, with all the stakeholders, in making sure that resiliency is in all our plans and innovation provides for a sustainable economic development. I think the, the, the most important point to address are inequalities and uh, damages, loss of lives, are uh, all traits to vulnerabilities and inequalities. There was a George Washington University study that went into the causes of casualties after the storms. And the devastation was such that uh, close to 3,975 deaths were somehow attributed to the storms. These are huge numbers. One death is too much. So the data showed that those, the incidence of higher death probability was in those communities that were more vulnerable because they were in flood pro zones or because they were poor and couldn't access health services in a timely manner. So uh, we have the highest population in the hemisphere, for example, and dialysis uh, 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 for, for our renal conditions. So they couldn't reach uh, a dialysis center and, and uh, casualties occurred. So I think that we need to address the inequality, poverty in our jurisdictions as the best, the best uh, tool to address sustainability and to address resiliency. A strong house can confront and sustain a high winds or a, 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 a flood. A healthy human being can sustain a storm. So in, a, in, a, in our lessons learned, we need to work with bridging and, and, and closing that gap of the poverty and equality in our island. Yeah, very challenging indeed, yeah. Uh, Carla, let, let, let me ask you, uh, in, in Santiago de Chile, which is a metropolitan, large metropolitan area in, in, in South America, how do, you, how do you see, how do you tackle, how do you address uh, at the same time, sustainability, resilience, and, and uh, efficiency of resources for a city. Primero, muy buenos días a todos, a todas. Estamos muy contentos como delegación chilena desde Santiago de Chile y también de otras regiones. Si bien yo represento a la región metropolitana, también hay de Viña del Mar y de Quique, eh, poder estar presente hoy día en este congreso y en particular acá en la organización de FIRA, contarles que nuestro gobierno regional aspira a tener su propia fira en nuestra región metropolitana de Santiago. Y venimos en una delegación con nuestros consejeros, con nuestro gobierno regional, y están el consejero Mayea, el consejero Cornejo, el consejero Moreno, la consejera Valenzuela, 
el director de Corfo, Álvaro Undurraga, que es nuestra agencia de competitividad, hay representantes de la Municipalidad de Las Condes, concejales, eh, personas de las empresas de nuestro país y finalmente la primera pregunta que usted muy bien hacía con el titular, ¿no? La ciudad que queremos. Bueno, la ciudad que queremos y que fue solicitada por el presidente Sebastián Piñera en Chile es una ciudad más amable, una ciudad más inclusiva y una ciudad más equitativa. ¿Y cómo se logra eso? Nosotros estamos convencidos que con ciudades en acción, con ciudades que tengan objetivos claros, que tengan estrategias, que definan esos ejes estratégicos y que le pongan algunos indicadores que permitan evaluar e inyectar los recursos con eficiencia y con equidad. Nosotros le queremos poner a estos indicadores, a esta estrategia, le queremos poner, obviamente, resiliencia, como construimos esta región más resiliente. Pero también queremos mirarla desde la perspectiva de género, creemos que es relevante, y también nosotros queremos mirarla con equidad. ¿Qué es lo que ha pasado? Y no sé si les ha tocado vivirlo en sus lugares. Puede ser que en sus países, en sus ciudades, las decisiones de inversión se tomen discrecionalmente? ¿Puede ser que les haya pasado que no necesariamente los recursos se inviertan donde deben invertirse? Yo creo que la respuesta es que sí. Que lamentablemente los recursos incluso pueden llegar dependiendo de una afinidad política, de una cercanía y no de una brecha de inequidad. Y nosotros como gobierno regional aspiramos hoy día a crear indicadores que le hemos llamado indicadores de bienestar territorial, donde nosotros, la academia, la empresa privada, el gobierno, vamos a identificar dónde tenemos que poner un buen peso. ¿Por qué? Porque no tenemos muchos recursos. Y como no tenemos muchos recursos, la ética de la equidad dice que hay que colocarlos donde lo necesitamos. Y con este mapa de nuestra ciudad vamos a poder decir Aquí se necesita una inversión en deporte. Aquí se necesita una inversión en salud. Aquí falta movilidad. Y si falta acceso al transporte, no es lo mismo una mujer que probablemente no va directo al trabajo, sino que primero pasa a dejar a los niños o tiene que llevarlos al centro de salud o tiene que ir efectivamente a otro lugar por su casa y va a ser bast bastantes estaciones antes que un hombre que habitualmente solamente va al trabajo. Ese cambio de mirada es el desafío de las ciudades inteligentes. Poner la inteligencia para poner a las personas en el centro. Y eso yo creo que es lo más revolucionario que podemos hacer. Porque si seguimos haciendo las cosas como las hemos hecho hasta ahora, vamos a ampliar la brecha gigantesca de inequidad que tenemos una región que tiene un corazón urbano gigantesco con más de 5 millones de personas y una gran extensión rural donde están las más grandes deficiencias. Muy bien, muchas gracias, Carla. So thank you for this approach on how a city sees the development not only for the city itself but for the its region which is extremely important put it in the, the citizen in the middle which is basically the, the, the key point. I w we will have a, a, another contribution, maybe it's, it's, it's worth having the, the approach of, a, of a, a city platforms now, uh, Ulrich. Uh, at which extent data platforms can help cities and can contribute to more sustainable uh, cities, uh, taking in into account as well the, 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 the two uh, first interventions we have, we have had in this panel. Yeah, first of all, uh, digitizing is changing our world. Uh, definitely, that's not only true for manufacturing companies when talking about Industry 4.0, that's also true for cities. And I'm very impressed uh, to see how much has changed over the last year when walking around here uh, at the exhibition. We are not just uh, seeing uh, pilot implementations, we are seeing really broad implementations of smart city platforms. And uh, the basis for digitization are data and context information. So information describing what's happening around us, when, where, and why. But very often we see that this information are organized in silos, in data silos due to organizational reasons, due to technical reasons, because interfaces don't uh, fit to each other, data models don't fit. 
and uh, it is our mission, and I think it is important to break down these silos. And uh, creating a really sustainable and resilient smart city means to be effective and also efficient. Effective means to do the right things. And one important thing a city has to do is to decide for one platform. Uh, to be able to break down the silos, to bring all the relevant information from a city onto one platform. And we have great examples for that uh, in Europe. Uh, for example, the world or the European leading company, uh, country when it comes to digitization of public processes is with no question Estonia. Many say it's, it's a small country, it's easy, but um, they really had a vision 15, 20 years ago to make Estonia digital, and they decided in a very first step to create one platform. In that case, it's a bit older technology called uh, uh, Xtron, but uh, they went for this one platform approach. So um, it is, as I said, very important in a first step in the effectivity, uh, in the efficiency step, to create and decide for one platform. And then it is a question which platform to use. And uh, there was an uh, analysis by the European Commission some time ago uh, when they counted 360 IoT platforms worldwide. That is uh, one and a half years ago. In the meantime, we are talking about more than 500 platforms coming from uh, different origins. Uh, most of them are commercial platforms. We are promoting an open source based um, approach and uh, independent for which way you go, it's important, as I said, to go for one platform. In our case, we are convinced that it is more cost efficient and uh, finally sustainable uh, to go with open source approaches, although there are also several examples where we have hybrid approaches, commercial and open source ones uh, together. And uh, here I can, uh, talking about new things which happened since uh, last year, that uh, the European Commission and all member states of the European Commission have uh, elected the core component of Fiverr, which is the uh, platform uh, I'm promoting uh, and I'm responsible for. Uh, the member states have elected the core component of Fiverr to be a so-called CEF building block. CEF stands for Connecting Europe Facility, so one of the big programs to make the digital single market of the European Commission reality. And the core component, the context broker of Fiverr, is now one of the eight building blocks of this program. And uh, a second achievement during the last year and a new uh, topic is that uh, the API, the interface, so the question how to get access to data, uh, which is used within the Fiverr environment, has been elected um, as a, a standard by a standardization organization called Etsy. And uh, in the meantime, more than 120 cities from 24 different countries, not only from Europe, are building their smart city based on Fiverr and uh, on an open source approach. And uh, I think this is one way to create a sustainable and resilient uh, platform for digitizing a city and uh, to make it a place of choice for the citizens and to improve the quality of life of the citizens. Thank you, Ulrich. Uh, it's a good point that you mentioned European Commission because it's, now it's time to, to Joanna. Uh, <laughs> Mm. Yeah, how do you, I mean, from the European Com Commission perspective, uh, which are the main challenges that uh, a sustainable, resilient, and efficient city has to face, especially in Europe, right? Thank you very much for this very charged question, but I'm very happy to be answering it, even if four minutes is never going to be enough. But I think I can give a taster from the policymaker point of view, and sitting at a level, the European, at the European Union level, where we have the opportunity to work with so many governments, regional governments, local governments, representatives of cities, and at the end of the day, we have to deliver to the citizen a quality of life. Now, I am quite privileged to come from the part of the European Commission where we are working directly on what makes people's lives 
having more quality, clean air, clean water, well-managed uh, mobility and uh, different types of mobility, basically making them live a life which they would not like to compromise either on their health or on their mobility possibilities and even less on their jobs. So I think at the end of the day, what we're talking about here when we talk about resilience is talking about getting the balance right between having a city that works, that's very modern, that offers different solutions, and at the same time, we're living within the limits of our planet. And I think this is the type of balance that within the European Commission we have been trying to get right for the past 40 plus years. And I mentioned 40 plus years and not 60 plus years, which is the age of the European Union, because environmental policy is only 40 plus years old. And we have put together a number of legislative instruments which to answer your question, would be the first challenge to get right. And that is having the right policies in place and having also the most important other point is to make sure that you can implement them. In other words, having also the stick rather than just the carrot. So of course, we are in a position to say, yes, we think we've got at least the right and most important basic fundamental points there for a city to be able to thrive and to be future-proof vis-a-vis the limits of the planet, vis-a-vis -vis the risks of climate change, energy efficiency, etc. vis-a-vis -vis sharing data, for instance, we have the environmental agency in Copenhagen which absorbs and gets a lot of data and actually shares it and issues reports regularly in order to share with other parts of the Commission which are not only taking care of the environment. But I think the other most important point is to be in touch with the economy. Of course we need IT solutions, of course we need that. But I don't think that cities are only looking for IT solutions. They are looking for, that is an enabler, just as financing is an enabler, in my view, in a city, and therefore having the right finances in place, but I think we have to have a, a situation where the citizens know that their policymakers are one, very much in touch with their needs and expectations, very much in touch with the needs of having sustainable policies which will create jobs, which will stimulate investment, which will stimulate innovation um, in order to have the right solutions, which will make them affordable, and which at the end of the day are within the trends, the worldwide trends, the global trends, for instance, of having good waste management, but having also good circularity in the economy. And these are things that obviously sound very good and you know, very much directional, but at the end of the day, we need to adapt them to the real circumstances of the city or the mini city you know, that we are living in. We have to keep in mind that by 2050, 70 if not more percent, if not 80 percent of the world population will be living in cities. And so at the end of the day, what we need to ensure is that city uh, governance is very much linked not only to data, which is important to know, for instance, how we're doing on air quality, on water quality, water sanitation, etc., on waste, but also to have these leaders also being involved in the design of the policies and which at the end of the day are aimed at uh, ticking the boxes also on the economy, not only on the targets for waste or for climate change. Uh, thank you very much. You mentioned one thing which is really important is the, the impact of all these projects and all these initiatives and the policies as well. And I would like to, to, to pick up on this argument to, to ask Bahé, uh, since last year, so eventually we were here last, last year and, and now, which is from your perspective, uh, all these uh, data platforms and initiatives on sustainable cities on the field being implemented, which is your, your, your observation of that, at which extent we are succeeding? At which extent we are just slowing down too much these initiatives? No, that's great. First of all, thank you uh, for inviting me to be on this uh, amazing panel. Uh, you know, it's. I think you know what I would say that you know, having spent some time yesterday in the in the booth and you know, spending time with partners and and of course city uh, leaders, what comes up very very clearly is that uh, you know there's a interesting 
convergence between uh, artificial intelligence and IoT, more than it was 12 months ago. And that's clearly you know, a strong catalyst of driving this transformation that you know, we are you know, touching you know, uh, you know, across here. Uh, th the second thing is that it, 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 it looks clearly that we move from a multiplication of pilots to some degree to really realize that you have almost a, an IoT built in by default. You know, in what you do. And so basically, it's obvious to say that every new building, every new school, or every new hospital potentially, you know, is going to be smart. But of course, we need to catch up with the legacy infrastructure that we have. And the beauty is that for the first time, we have the combination of the, the accumulation of data, which to some degree in a kind of 1.0 version was not very much insightful, and the high computing capability you know, uh, at the edge almost to make the most of it. And I think when I, I was asking questions to some of the partners, yeah, just to get the sense of if uh, uh, one was last year as a metric or, you know, uh, tell me where we are today in terms of number of uh, effective projects that you have been running, implementing in cities, in emerging markets, or let's say more mature or developing, the ratio was basically around 10. And when I said, yeah, let's push ourselves to think about, you know, when, it, when we think now about pipeline and covering only these three dimensions, the, the resource efficiency, the, the resiliency, and the sustainability, we are close to 100. So it's almost give you the sense of the acceleration and the maturity mm -hmm. of the solutions that are enabled, as you said, you know, from, you know, what we are bringing. And in the end of the day, I think all these solutions are possible only because, uh, Yes, there are platforms, and Ulrich mentioned there are multiple, let's say, options, and uh, the commissioner as well. But I think, I think the, the most interesting thing is the, the, the ecosystem that is around the platforms. Uh, because the ecosystem is really building the added value to the citizens, to the cities. And uh, I think the, the biggest challenge today, because these topics are so profound, is very much to understand what's, what is what you are trying to solve for. Because you can boil the ocean. So do you have a dream? Is there, you know, what's the objective? Do you have clear outcomes? What's the timeline? I think this is the next, let's say, thing that, you know, uh, as a collective community, we, we need to tackle. But the, the ecosystem is there. The technology is there. There are options. There are choices. Uh, the, the, the problem solving, I mean, think about, uh, Commissioner mentioned, uh, by 2050, you mentioned 70% of the population will live in cities. Well, 70%, that means 3.5 more billion people living in cities. All right. uh, in the last, do you know that, you know, somehow this data point is that in the last two years, you know, the 90% the of the human data has been created in the last two years. So when the question was, what's your observation in the last one year? Well, think about what we're going to do with that. And I, I do believe that what we see is a combination between public data, private data, you know, uh, network sentiment, social so information, and bring this together into a kind of, let's say, comprehensive data lake. So I think that's, uh, that's probably one of the, you know, direction to take as a, as a discussion. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, Carla, just to, to maybe start with, a, with a, a common debate and feel free to intervene whenever you, you feel. Uh, you, you mentioned one thing which is extremely important. I mean, in the metropolitan area, you, you talked about uh, Santiago, or the, 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 which is the big city, but as well you have to link with rural areas and with the neighbor cities. How do you approach in terms of uh, uh, implementation of these policies and these interventions uh, and link the interests of a big city with the, this surrounding small or rural areas? Como decía anteriormente, como nosotros queremos construir esta región más equitativa, lo primero que tenemos que lograr a nuestro juicio es establecer puntos, y así le hemos llamado, de acupuntura urbana. Acupuntura, como la entendemos todos, de medicina tradicional china, puntos de energía que despierten la ciudad. Estos espacios de urbanismo que finalmente permiten recuperar lugares abandonados, lugares que generan delincuencia, lugares que eh, pueden tener problemáticas de basura y que finalmente generan eh, que esos lugares finalmente no puedan desarrollar su vocación. Entonces nosotros activamos ese punto de energía. 
para poder construir finalmente un corazón de barrio. ¿A qué le hemos llamado los corazones de barrio? A descubrir la vocación de los espacios públicos, de las comunidades, con la gente. No le tenemos miedo a la participación ciudadana, creemos efectivamente que es la gente la que construye el barrio en el que quiere vivir, y eso lo hace sostenible. Pero ¿para qué también? Para que uno no tenga que salir de su barrio si es que no quiere. Y es por eso que le hemos llamado prismas de equidad. ¿A qué buscamos con los prismas de equidad? Que la gente tenga cerca un buen colegio, un buen centro de salud, pueda llegar relativamente rápido a su trabajo, que tenga un área verde o un lugar donde hacer deporte y que efectivamente esto esté cerca de donde quiere vivir y donde está su vocación de barrio. Porque no todos los barrios son iguales. Y es parte de lo que queremos descubrir con esta iniciativa que estamos trabajando en nuestro gobierno regional. Y ahí tenemos que entender que tenemos una región que es diferente. Tenemos lugares donde está todo, el área verde, la movilidad, el acceso a la economía y otros donde falta agua potable. ¿Podemos tratarlas de forma igual? No es posible. Y es parte de esta relación que tenemos que tener entre nuestras comunas para construir una región. Y nuestra región con otra región, como es la quinta región, donde debiéramos estar conectados a través de trenes de cercanía, porque creemos en la región que los rieles son imbatibles. Uh -huh. Y si nos conectamos con la quinta región o con la sexta región, vamos a ser una metrópolis de más de 10 millones de habitantes. Si bien somos un área metropolitana, vamos a lograr ser más de 10 millones. Y ahí los beneficios de este Santiago del 2041, de los 500 años, se van a ver en la gente, en la de más escasos recursos, en la que el desarrollo no llega, donde tenemos este Santiago que todo el mundo lo ve como una gran metrópoli, ¿no? como un Santiago de negocios, de clase mundial, pero donde todavía tenemos mucha gente que no tiene agua potable. Esa es la misión, ese es el desafío. Es un desafío muy interesante, ¿no? ¿Cómo hacerlo? Si me permite agregar a ese diseño y reconocimiento, en la mañana estaba hablando con el pasado mayor de Barcelona, con Joan Clos, y estaba hablando, estaba asombrado por la infraestructura que él fue capaz de desarrollar para celebrar los Juegos Olímpicos hace unos años atrás. Y le pregunté, ¿cómo lo hiciste? ¿Cómo lo hiciste? how such a challenging endeavor uh, was so successfully executed. And he told me it was all about the collaboration, the engagement of the volunteers, the collaborations of all the region, not, not just uh, Barcelona. So I think uh, sometimes boundaries and counties uh, are just a creation of, of policy makers, but the fiber of, of the people of the communities goes, don't, don't recognize that. So I think it's a great opportunity that whenever we uh, uh, want to engage in social change, to, to, to have the community involvement, which is required for a successful execution of change, of, of transformations, uh, requires that, that engagement. And you need to do that from the start. Have that, make sure that they participate in those decisions. So when you're ready to deploy and execute, They're, 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 they're motivated, they're engaged uh, uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting views. Go going a bit deeper in, in this direction, and, and I may ask Joanna from the European uh, perspective and, and policymaker, we have been thinking or uh, talking about the big metropoles, and it's a very nice view of uh, an opportunity of uh, using these big metropoles not as a, as a, uh, a danger, but an opportunity for the rest of the, of the surrounding areas. How do we balance the big metropoles with the small giants, which in Europe we have plenty of them, these middle-sized uh, uh, cities, which are really a key element for that? And, and how to balance these, these two types of cities and how a, a policymaker can drive, drive uh, equally the policies to those in order to really boost sustainability? As I said, 
being part of the European Union, um, obviously we don't only have big cities. We have the smaller metropolis as well, which are also becoming an important link also to the bigger ones, and they actually support the bigger ones because they take in, let's say, parts of the population and therefore part of the stresses and the burdens that the bigger ones would have to do. So obviously we have to be in a position to see the bigger picture of who's doing how and what, you know, the big data gap. So I think a key challenge would be the data, having the data right, you know, getting the data right about, for instance, how are the cities doing on the waste directives, for instance, how much of the recycling targets are they reaching and how are they handling it? How are they dealing with climate change risks, for instance, flood flashing, for instance, for flash, um, flash floods. Um, how are they doing with the transport system? You know, how many lanes and how, what is the urban planning? You know, how is the planning going on transport? So there are these indicators which come out of the legislation, not only from the G environment, but also from all parts of the European Commission. And basically that make up holistically city life. And having the data available and having the also opportunities to showcase um, the, the champions, shall we say, the champions of, you know, who are the front runners in, 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 in this, it's not a race, but it's a transition. Huh? Mm -hmm. Then using that in order to get others, those who are followers or who are a bit less evolved, to bring them up to speed as well. We have those tools of doing that. Now, of course, it's not only about the policy making, it's about making it happen on the ground. Unless we use cities or we, we conceive cities as the ultimate showcase of how urban planning could be actually mainstreamed, it's not just an exception, but it's the norm, unless we actually make happen and push towards, let's say, having cities as the showcase of reduced consumption, more recycling, for instance, you know, having the repair mentality coming in, the collaborative economy being more and more as mainstreamed into the life of that city, then of course, how can we hope that these will actually be believed in by the citizens themselves? So of course, cities need to be empowered, but also need to be leveraged, both by good examples coming from other cities, by, by themselves being involved in the design of of, of uh, uh, urban policy, a sustainable urban policy, but also by encouraging the investment towards the innovation and the skills towards making it happen. Let's say, not only a circular economy, but anything to do with innovation to actually happen within that city and to keep the skills there and to encourage people, not only to be part of the city, but also to have their, work, their, their economic well-being guaranteed by the city within a quality of life. So in my view, it, this won't happen just by itself. It will happen because there is funding, and in the European Union, of course, we do not only have the funding to make it happen. For instance, in the next budget perspectives of post-2020, what is being proposed by the Commission is that 6% of the development funds, of the regional development funds, 6% of the global envelope will be going to uh, sustainable urban, uh, urban planning, which is a big plus. It then depends on the member states, the governments, of whether how much of that will actually be prioritized into being the most important actions that will actually be supported. So it, it, of course, you have to make the funding available, you have to make the policy making design involvement uh, at an early stage, you have to get the experts and the expertise, but you also at the end of the day have to make it visibly happening and seen to be happening by the citizens. This is the only way how you can then engage the citizen to actually themselves become the actors, not only of the, the waste management part, which is maybe the more boring part, but you know, it's where the responsibility of the citizen is engaged, but also of having the citizen themselves being the promoters of new technologies, of, of innovations, and of also of, of work streams or job streams that will be new because of the sustainable work plan that is being adhered to not only by the local governments or the regional government, but also in the center by the, by the main governments. Okay. Ulrich, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe I can just uh, add to this. As you mentioned, two important things, uh, the data and front runners. So um, cities uh, taking the lead and making it possible. Um, 
as I said before, important to have a, a platform, important to define a common interface to get access to the data. And we just published on Monday together with TM Forum, which is uh, a global organization of telco and IT companies, more than 700 uh, organizations belong to them. Uh, we initiated a joint collaboration program together with 11 frontrunner cities to work on common data models. So uh, after we have agreed on the standard interface, now also to agree on the standard data models. So a data model for waste management, a data model for smart parking, for smart lightning, to make it easier in the future to replicate a solution from one city to the other, which makes it more uh, cost efficient. And uh, here, as I said, we are working together at the, in a starting point with uh, 11 front runner cities, also big cities in this case, but uh, in all our approach, although the majority in the future will live in urban areas in, in cities, we don't have to forget the smaller cities, we don't have to forget the rural areas, and uh, I'm convinced we need a different approach uh, for these areas. Uh, a city like Barcelona can uh, afford to create an own way, to create an own platform, but uh, for uh, the smaller cities, for rural areas, we need more a shared service approach driven by organizations who take over the lead and then provide these uh, services also to these areas. And having common data models, having common interfaces, uh, interfaces will make this very cost efficient uh, and easy. And finally, we are talking about technology, but we don't have uh, to forget the people uh, for whom we are doing this. And who will partly have to use this. Uh, it is always a question of having people and technology at the same time. Otherwise, uh, the best technology will not work if it is not adapted and accepted uh, by the people. If I may, because it's relevant to what Ulrika just said, I would like to say a couple of things. One, we have just um, launched a green city tool, we have called it, and basically this is uh, a tool which is available on the, on the web, cities, any city can register themselves um, on the tool um, or they can actually make themselves more visible on the actual map because if they want to have, make commitments more public and more visible to other cities and this is a way of how they can assess themselves vis-a-vis uh -huh. -vis the criteria of sustainability, clean air, water, uh, waste management, etc. biodiversity as well, but it's also a way of attracting the technical expertise to them if they need it. So the point about having the data and making it also palatable to the citizen, because we believe that, and we actually source a lot of data directly because of citizen Signal. involvement, the so-called citizen science umbrella, if you like, and many cities um, and ourselves as European Commission are involved via our agency in Copenhagen to involve cities to act to citizens to actually um, give data um, about I don't know the air quality for instance if you go on the website of the environmental agency you'll see in your particular city how they they are faring at any given time in real time about air quality in particular spots and this is thanks to not only the satellite information that we also use of course in the European Union but also because of citizen science that is more and more becoming, let's say, not the norm, but it's on its way to becoming more the norm to get citizens involved as well in reporting back, you know, what the quality is, let's say, on air quality, which, by the way, many member states are still struggling with, mm -hmm. uh, even if, you know, the legislation is, as I said, 40 years and more old, and is costing cities, we estimate about 24 billion uh, euros in terms of health costs, lost working days, and also damage to buildings because of air quality uh, be being not uh, up to the standards uh -huh. that member states had signed up to many, many years ago. Carla, you had a, a question or? Uh? Sí, yo quisiera preguntar porque uno de los desafíos más grandes, vamos a esperar ahí. <laughs> uno de los desafíos más grandes que eh, hemos tenido en esta construcción de indicadores de bienestar son nuestras zonas rurales dentro de nuestra región. No tenemos data. El Santiago Urbano tiene data. Hasta Manzana 
hasta muy cercano al hogar, rural, no tiene data. Estamos construyendo un indicador con muy poca información. Y, y mi pregunta es, ¿cómo efectivamente son, podemos ser capaces de avanzar hacia esa otra mirada? Porque está dentro de una misma región. No es que sea una región aparte, es la misma región que tiene zonas rurales que además tienen las externalidades del Santiago Urbano. Ahí está la basura, ahí falta acceso al transporte, ahí no están los médicos, ahí falta agua potable. Entonces, ¿cómo se construye efectivamente esa data que parece no interesarle a los que entregan información? ¿Cómo generamos ese incentivo? Mm -hmm. May I just uh, yeah, sure. directly answer to that? Um, first of all, it is important um, to have the uh, infrastructure in place, of course, to get access to the data. So um, uh, on the one side, uh, to have uh, wherever possible fiber, fiber um, connections available, but also um, these uh, LoRa networks, uh, yeah, uh, long range uh, networks, low energy, Uh, are an instrument to get access on the uh, uh, on uh, rural areas, and uh, we are uh, actually working, for example, together with the World Bank in India, uh, where we are uh, creating a shared service platform for smart cities in India, also addressing smaller cities um, and rural areas uh, to get access using this technology. But uh, of course, you are right; you need to have the infrastructure in place first before being able uh, to get access to data. I think, yeah. Just maybe uh, Go ahead. On, mm -hmm. on, this, on this last, uh, you know, because it's an interesting, uh, very interesting topic. There's one initiative that we have done uh, at Microsoft, which is very much targeted on the, you know, the, to the rural areas that don't have the infrastructure to carry the, the information flow. And we, we uh, What we are doing is we, we, we partner you know, uh, with uh, the cities in these type of regions to leverage, in fact, what we we'll call the, the TV white space. So basically the signals of the TV you know, network that is not used, which is available, you know, usually more than, in fact, the, the Wi-Fi. And through that, we can convey you know, and, and, and get access to the, to, the, to the data in the farms, for example, and, and, and have, let's say, the collection and then, in fact, the, the, the production to it. So if you are interested, we can, we can follow up. But this is a very cheap, accessible, and enable everyone to participate as opposed to exclude. Correct. One, one, one comment that is important to, to what you mentioned is data and data platforms. Uh, and it's important that a big city may afford uh, The, the investment and other small cities, it could be more difficult. How do you, so who, who pays the party, right? I mean, how a city, a small city, can invest in an infrastructure which may be significant for them and may be linked to other cities as well surrounding, but uh, what is the benefit? I mean, uh, how the city services see already a benefit so that they can demonstrate that they can uh, uh, make the investment reliable and, and, and feasible. And, they can assure that they can implement these, these, these platforms, which is the best way for a city, for especially for small ones, to, to cope with these uh, investments. Any insights on that? Yeah, um, yeah maybe okay. question to me or? Well, to whoever wants yeah, to answer. Uh, maybe, maybe I can start. B uh, both of the platforms. Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing, and I, maybe I'm not going to have some friends here, but you know, I, I, every meeting I've had with cities, maybe more on the mature side than, let's say, you know, to be fair, You know, the question has never been an issue about the funding. The issue is more, let's say, we have these assets. What, how can you help us to, on, on how to do it? On a secure, compliant way, you know, to the regulation in vigor. You know, that, that's more the discussion. And the, 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 tough, the tough part of it is to, because it's a huge, you know, ocean of opportunities or solutions, you know, how you bring, you know, back to the center, the citizen, What is the dream for that city? How that city is part of a bigger community, as you mentioned, so that in fact the data that are existing somewhere else can benefit you know, the city there. I think that's the one thing. So funding has never been an issue as long as you can put yourself in the context of, uh, for again, the most developed cities. I, I, uh, it's a public partnership, you know, public-private partnership. But what you have is that there's an investment that we as, let's say, commercial entities, uh, and I'm sure Ulrich, you know, will, will add to it, but 
you know, we, we look, we are not here for the short term, we are here for the long run. So, the, the, and before being at Microsoft for us, we are citizens of a country, you know, uh, citizens of a city. We are born there, we are friends and families and connections, and we want the prosperity of it. We are absolutely self-aware of the challenges that the city is facing. But what is needed is, let's say, what kind of direction? Do we want to build uh, a startup environment which is, you know, generating the talent that we need to create the solution for the future? That's one option. Some others are saying, you know what, we know what is good because we have enough data and we are going to create a platform for people to come and participate. And by the way, the people can't be only from the city, the country, but from the European Union or from the rest of the world. We see that more and more. So I would say the, the challenge is not the, 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 the funding always because it's a repartition of the funding based on the investment and the output. It's more the clarity of what we want to achieve. Okay. That has been the most complicated thing to clarify. Okay. Let me just one comment for the organization. I, I, we are not controlling the time anymore, so I need the time in the screens, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Organizers, mm -hmm. I need the time on the screens, otherwise we are out of... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah maybe I can, uh, I can add on that. Uh, I've been uh, for 20 years in the city parliament, so deciding about the city budget, uh, finally, and uh, still being a strategic uh, initiative, we need a business case uh, to start such activities and to finance it, finally. And uh, here it is important to find the right first use cases uh, to use such uh, platform approaches. And very often, uh, for example, the topic of smart lightning uh, is something which pays off within four to five years, simply replacing traditional lightning by LED lightning, which can even be dimmed, so smart lightning, that it only lights when, when the light is required. And uh, uh, two weeks ago, I've been, for example, in Montevideo in uh, Uruguay. Um, they learned about uh, our platform two years ago here in Barcelona, implemented their platform, and they are now replacing 70,000 street lights in the city um, by LED lights. And this is a project, as I said, which pays for itself. Okay. Um, and uh, it is important to find such first approaches uh, to have uh, a starting position to create a smart city. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, uh, it, it, because it's, it's uh, you can really now demonstrate very quickly the the return on the investment. I mean, if you think about the biggest challenge, you know, and the cost, you know, in the, in basically in uh, in resource efficiency is the outage on energy, uh, and 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 now with the metering information that we have and the systems, you know, it basically in less than 18 months you can be increase by 25 to 30 percent, in fact, the energy and, and prevent from the outage. Uh, if you think about leakage, you know, in both from home and, and let's say, you know, uh, the corporations, you know, we have enough, let's say, information now to, to, to drive this forward. Think about, let's say, even the, the notion of, uh, as we talked about resilience and you were mentioning the catastrophe in Puerto Rico. I mean, now we have what we call the digital twins that helps you yeah. to respond to the question, what if something else happened? And you know, the ability to have a real world and a virtual world that you can simulate is not only for national, you know, na national catastrophe, and you know, it could be for any type of, let's say, you know, decision that the city might want to take and the consequences based on the information that you have. This is powerful, let's say, tools that you can really see the return on investment very quickly and communicate to the citizens the value that you are doing. Yeah. Luis, maybe you want to comment on that. I mean, do you see us data platforms and, and, and ICT-based tools, uh, uh, the magic solution? for eventually for, for managing cities and, and your country, or how do you say that? Uh, I, I think uh, data is power, and uh, we found out that when, when you are responding to, let's say, an emergency, uh, you need the data. You need uh, agility, uh, but certainly you need situational awareness. Where do you stand? What do you need to respond, and what's, what are your priorities? And that you get through the proper data to make those decisions. So uh, after, the, after the hurricanes, we uh, developed what's the business emergency operations centers. Because in the island, we have externalized through uh, public-private partnerships many services uh, that used to be delivered by government. And now it's done more efficiently through NGOs or, or, or through prop, uh, P3s. And, uh, all that information uh, re regarding energy, fuel supplies, um, health, all is in the hands of the private sector. Through this uh, platform, 
that it is a, a public-private partnership. Now we gather in a live uh, depository all the data that is required to make the proper decisions when you are responding to a, a, an emergency. And it's also used to make decisions as to your businesses do it with business intelligence. We do it uh, in the way that we know how to impact and where uh, our, our stakeholders. So certainly uh, the technological platforms are, are essential, but then you also need the what if. What if you, if you don't have them available? So the, the redundancy is, is of, of most importance also. Okay, thank you. I think it's, it's also time to, to open the floor to the, to, to open the, the time for questions and open it to the floor. Uh, you may use the, the, the app uh, of, the, of the Congress to send uh, us any, any question you, you may have through this uh, uh, questioning and, and ask uh, feature of the application. We may have the, on the screen uh, your question, so if you want to address any particular question uh, to a particular uh, panelist or, or uh, general question, just feel free to do so. Uh, we'll have uh, quite soon showing up all the questions here in the panel, so we, we, can, we can answer that. Uh, while we wait for the, for the questions, let, let me go uh, through the panel again with, with open th uh, questions as well. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, about data, and data is extremely important to optimize infrastructure, to, to take decisions, to really target these acupuncture decisions. Uh, what about the, the, the data itself, uh, security? We may use the data for security, but what about privacy as well? which are the, the main challenges, uh, uh, and especially in the several cases we have been talking about, uh, like Santiago, Puerto Rico, or even at, at a global level, which are the issues in that and which, which could be the, the solutions? Yeah, I think it's, it's a super, super valid question on the, you can talk about data, platform, scale, agility, without, let's say, having a, a conscious uh, thought process you know, on multiple, let's say, you know, topics. I think security, you, you just mentioned it. Uh, and, you know, this is a constant, let's say, innovation on how to prevent from any threats. Uh, what, we, what we announced, let's say, recently is uh, what we call the, the Azure Sphere, uh, which, you know, gives the security all the way to the silicon, the, the chipset, to the operating system, to the cloud. So basically, you have multiple layers of, let's say, security because of the the, the proliferation of devices. Basically, I think the prediction are 25 billion uh, things, you know, by 2020. The second thing is the, the, the data privacy. I mean, the compliance to the authorities and the regulation and partnering with the policymakers to make sure that, you know, there's no gap in the understanding uh, of the evolution of the technology and how this technology is protecting the citizen is absolutely su super important. The third thing I would say is that transparency. We, we don't speak too much about transparency, yeah. but the transparency is a critical thing. What do we do with the data? Mm -hmm. You know, both citizens, of course, cities, authorities have to understand, and we need to be very clear on that part. Uh, and then I think that there, there's something which is around, let's say, the ethical aspect that is increasingly important because of the artificial intelligence and how the generation of coders, of developers, who are really tackling big problems, you know, are also aligned with some policies that are regulating some, in fact, the code of ethics, which doesn't exist necessarily, you know, today on the on a, on a role play. So that these are the key things that we know. Mm -hmm. Any other comments on, on that? Yeah. Maybe Joanna? I mean, this is an important point regarding transparency. I've just come from a, a forum this morning in another venue about the uh, sustainable uh, action plan on, on sustainable finance. and. One key point that we're working on in the European Commission is about the, actually the transparency on the environmental risks and, and, and how they should be put in the equation for any type of investment decision that is taken in order to define an investment as a green investment. We're working on a classification system there. But the, the point I wanted to make is that, of course, we need to not only have a system where the risks are visibly taken into account, but where actually this all depends on how transparent we are with the data such, including to the citizen. Mm -hmm. Also to raise the level of responsibility that the citizens themselves in the city need to themselves feel responsible to adhering to and collaborating with the authorities. It's a good thing that we have a business plan, as already said uh, earlier, and indeed 
our experience in the European Commission and also some award schemes that we run for cities, for the front runners, like the Green, the Green City Awards, etc., which we run every year, you know, the boxes that they have to tick are quite um, challenging. Um, but the reason for that is that, you know, they need to show us and convince us that this plan is not just the plan that looks very good on paper, but in fact, you know, nobody is actually partaking and actually contributing to it being a success. In fact, the cities that in these 10 years of life that this award scheme has had, consistently, it has always been, you know, the key to success fundamentally has been a business plan, if you want to call it a business plan, call it what you want, but a business plan that in which the business community, in which the academics, in which the researchers, the data collectors, the, the, the policy makers, the citizens are part and parcel of, and which visibly that they are taking responsibility for. And this is how, you know, a collaborative effort actually make things happen and actually drives the transition in the city itself, and which in itself then drives investment to, to, to that city. Another point I wanted to mention is public procurement. We have not mentioned public procurement, but in my view, a city has a number, uh, uh, an amount of, of budget that's allocated to it or that it itself um, generates. But I think the way that public procurement is done is also an important signal that things are seriously be, uh, t being taken seriously in that city. And therefore, you know, the push towards green public procurement, sustainable public procurement is also a really, a really important point. Another last point I wanted to make is that, you know, at the end of the day, um, you know, old models might not always work, you know, in terms of how we're going to support um, sustainable policies. Let's take water, for instance. We've always been used to having, you know, water tariffs being charged. Now, what does this actually mean in the future? Um, can we still rely on those tar tariffs as being, you know, the responsibility quotient, if you like, of the citizen towards ensuring that water is clean, water, water is available to everybody and affordable, that water um, is not polluted, um, that we are actually being protected against the risks of climate change, like flash floods, for instance, or are we going to be a little bit more creative in the way that we, we tax water? Uh, maybe we should tax the polluter. You know, um, yeah. the polluter pays principle should also be applied in the water sector and not only in the emissions, for instance, which is, which is what we're doing right now. So these are things that I think the city um, can also contribute to because it is in touch with the businesses, with the, with the talent that's there and with the citizens and with the ambition that itself as a city has in order to be more sustainable and to have real sustainable planning mainstreamed in its own existence. Thank you very much. I think that since we are quite ahead of a schedule, we could take this final remark as a kind of a, of a conclusion. I think we have gone through data platforms, data issues, data benefits as well, and platforms approach. Uh, we have gone through the policymaker view and, and, and the challenges we have today in Europe, but in general in our society. And we have gone through a Puerto Rico case and, and Santiago de Chile case with this uh, 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 initiatives, very uh, precise, focalized, and optimized uh, uh, approach. I think it has been a very wide panel, uh, very interesting contribution, so I would like to thank you all the panelists. Uh, I apologize to the audience because we have had not any questions in the, in the app, and it's also late, so we have to catch up on the schedule. So uh, thank you very much for the audience, thank you very much the speakers for your contributions, and uh, I hope you have a very interesting uh, Congress uh, all the, the week along. Thank you very much. Thank you.